In this video, I'll be taking a look at the T-Rex tape machine collection and I'll be asking, can you hear it? Hi folks, I'm Mike and I hope you're well. So I've been trying out this T-Rex tape machine collection and I thought I'd give you guys the opportunity to tell me what differences you can hear when I apply it to different parts of a track. So with the four plugins in the collection, I've applied them to guitar, vocals, drums, and then one to the master as well. Now not only can you listen to them on YouTube here, but probably a better option is to follow the download links in the description where you can download some high quality versions of the recordings and let me know what differences you can hear. I'll be going through all of the different plugins, the different controls, how you operate them, so on and so forth. So please do stick around for all of that. Before we do get going, if you do like this kind of content, all about home recording, DAWs, gear reviews, plugin reviews, that kind of thing, then please do subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you're notified about my future videos. Now let's get stuck into some tape machines. So we're starting off with Tape Machine 24, which is modeled on the MCI JH24, which if you're not familiar, was a very popular machine in studios in the 1980s. And I've applied it to the vocals on my track here. Now with this machine, as with the other three, IK Multimedia claimed to have gotten an original machine, taken it apart and restored it to pristine working order, and then modeled each stage electronically, which was happening within that machine. So the controls that you see on the UI reflect that in that there are different parameters that you can change at different stages in the process. Now, I'm gonna spend a little bit longer on this uh, plugin than I will the other three, and that's because the controls are very similar, if not identical, on each of these plugins. So once you've learned how it works on this plugin, you'll understand the other three much easier. So let's start off with this control right on the left here, and that's the input control. Now, obviously what that's gonna do is send more or less signal to the plugin. This becomes really, really important on analog plugins a lot of the time because the harder you drive a signal into analog equipment, it can actually change the characteristics of what's happening to that signal. It'll add more color, um, perhaps more distortion and saturation when you drive it a bit harder. So I decided to add 5 dB um, of signal here. So let's just see what's happening to the signal now when we look at the VU meters over here. Only yesterday, honey, I was there with you only yesterday. So you can see I'm driving it fairly hard to make sure I get a, a nice effect there. Now I will say that it's important when you do add uh, volume, if you like, at this stage, that you also look at subtracting it potentially at the output stage. In other words, you want to volume match um, your plugins because what can happen is if you uh, just add volume or level to the sound, to human ears, it's naturally just going to sound better like that. And we don't really want to fool our ears like that. We want to hear the benefits which is actually happening within the plugin itself. So do remember to level match your plugins, and you'll do that. Um, Normally you would take a look at your um, meters and your DAW and make sure that it's not just getting louder when you turn the plug in on. Okay, so you can adjust that with the output volume there. Now I wouldn't have minded seeing a link between the input and the output uh, controls here. Some plugins have that so it'll automatically adjust the output as you add more to the input and, and it's nice to have that you know as a as a option that you can switch off and on. So perhaps in future versions they could consider that if they're watching. Now moving on we have this control here which is called true stereo so what happened with the original tape machines is there would be slight differences between the left and the right channels um, differences in distortion um, eq that kind of thing so this switches this on so that those slight differences do now exist between your left and your right channels i can't really see any reason why you would ever switch it off but thankfully it's switched on by default anyway now the next thing we're going to move on to here is transport modeling so what this is doing is this is mimicking the the small sort of irregularities you'll get in tape movement on the original machines um, so there's slight fluctuations in the sound because of that it's very very subtle but it's there and it can be quite nice you may want to switch off if you want to sort of a very perfectly steady performance um, but for me most of the time it's going to be fine to have that on and it is on by default so the next two controls that we see here, input and repro, are actually uh, toggle switches, so you can have one or the other. 
So when it's just on input, um, the modeling's only happening at the input and the output stages. So you probably won't hear an awful lot of difference. There may be a slight difference that you'll get with the sort of electronic uh, modeling from those stages, but you're going to get much more effect when Repro is switched on because it's passing through the whole system, all the different stages, including the tape itself, of course. The next options we have are to change the different tape formulas. We've got 250, 456, 499 and GP9. So these are based upon some original tape. I'll show you on the screen here now, um, which you can see here. So Scotch 250, Ampex 456, uh, Quantigy GP9 and Ampex 499. And they all have different characteristics. They are subtle, but you will hear them more and more the more you use these plugins. And it, it sort of depends on what you're applying them to as well. I'll give you a quick listen now and you tell me in the comments if you can hear any difference between these um, different tape formulas. Only yesterday, honey, I was there with you. Only yesterday, honey, you and I were two. Very, very subtle. Now, remember, I'm going to be some supplying um, some original recordings for download from my website. You may be able to hear some of these differences a bit clearer there. Um, but I personally prefer on this one the 456. Personal taste is what it's going to be there. Now, the other thing which I think makes a big difference is adjusting the actual tape speed. So we've got um, 15 inches per second and 30 inches per second as a choice here on this particular machine. Now, with the lower tape speeds, what you're going to tend to get is a little bit more warmth, whereas with the higher tape speeds, you'll get a lot more fidelity. So you're going to have to decide for yourself there. On this particular track with the vocals, I liked it on 30 inches per second. I wanted them to sound reasonably sort of pristine, um, so I kept it on that setting. So now we get to some of the really interesting controls here, which is where you can make the biggest difference to the sound. You'll notice that we've got three controls here which are marked for record and three which are marked for play. So these are representing things that can happen at the recording stage using the record heads and these ones for the playing stage of the tape. Now, let's start off with the more obvious ones. You'll see some are marked HF for high frequency and some are marked LF for low frequency. So these are basically um, uh, shelf controls. This is a high frequency shelf and you can increase it there. I'll just play so you can hear. Only yesterday, honey, I was there with you. Take it away. Only yesterday, honey, you and I were two. And you may ask, you know, why have it at um, a high frequency shelf control here and another one down here? And that's, as I say, in the modeling process, they're happening at different stages. So there can be slight differences between the effect that they will have. Um, now, apart from the level controls that we can also see here, the other really interesting control that I'm going to finish off with is the bias control. Now, I'm not going to pretend for a moment that I'm an expert on tape bias. I'm not. And much of what I'm about to tell you came from Wikipedia a couple of days ago, okay? So bear with me here for a moment, and then we'll talk about the actual differences that it makes to the sound. So... Um, what they wanted to do in early stages was improve the quality that they were getting from these tape machines. And they've, there's been a couple of different ways that they've done that. And that's with DC bias, which is the actual addition of current to the signal. They, they, they found that that improved the quality. And then also AC bias, which added a whole bunch of high frequencies, I think outside of human hearing, um, which was able to improve the quality of the recordings. I believe, don't quote me on this, but I think... Um, in the modeling of these machines, they were using DC bias. Now, what does it all accumulate to? Is that a good way of saying what's the cumulative effect of all of this? Um, well, first of all, if you under bias, so if you turn this down, what you'll find is you'll add uh, sort of more high frequencies, but quite a lot more distortion, okay? So that can be useful at times, and you'll see what it's done to the vocal with this very extreme setting here. Only yesterday. So it's distorted it enormously. In fact, it's uh, reduced the level a bit. So I'll just push the level up a little. Only yesterday. Now, it's very likely, unless you're using as an as an obvious effect, that it's very unlikely you'd actually want to add that. But you can hear that it adds some grit. It's more likely that you're going to use it kind of up here somewhere. Let's have a listen. 
Only yesterday, honey, I was there with you. And it just adds a little bit of subtle sort of grit there when you use that control, I find. Now, on the other extreme, when you over-bias, um, you get the effect of a much warmer, saturated signal there. So let's have a listen to that. Only yesterday, honey, I was there with you. Here it is originally. Only yesterday, and over -biased. Honey, you and I were too. And probably a little bit of a level increase there as well. So that's all of the controls for this particular tape machine. As I say, it's similar with all of them. So let's move on to the next one. So next we have Tape Machine 440, which is modelled on the Ampex 440B, a much older machine from the 1960s. And I've decided to apply it to my electric guitar in this song. And I've got to say up front that I really do love the sound of this plugin. I love what it's doing to my electric guitar, and I'm sure I'll be using it in the future because of that. However, I do have a couple of small gripes about the user interface, which I want to mention here. So let's talk about the user interface. First of all, with this one, like all of the plugins in this collection, you can resize the interface. Now, you may have seen in some other reviews that you can't resize it, but I think they've updated that. So definitely in the latest version, you can drag the corner out and resize it. And even to a very large size, it still maintains its glorious look in high definition. Or of course, you can shrink it down to a small size if you're short on screen real estate and it's that which I really want to talk about let's look at this area down here where the tape spins around we'll just play the song for a moment it's lovely to see it doesn't it look glorious it's mesmerizing and if you change the tape over here to a different tape formula then you'll see that reflected down there but honestly it's probably not not very necessary to see it at all, although it does look glorious and lots of effort has gone into it. So I'd love to see a toggle switch here somewhere. Just click on a toggle and that will hide it so that we can just see this small area of the screen. And for those of you who are lacking in screen real estate, I'm sure you would definitely appreciate that. Now the next small gripe I have is with these uh, switches over here for the true stereo and the transport modeling. I was a little confused as to which position was off and on. I didn't notice at first over here that of course on for this on switch over here which has a lamp to indicate its position on is up um, and it was a little confusing for me with these ones there's no indicator at all so perhaps in future versions IK Multimedia if you're watching you could put a lamp there of some kind or even just a, a little tool tip when you hover over showing what the current position is that could be nice too. So um, that's all I have to say about the interface. But as I say, I'm loving the sound of it. The only real difference here in terms of options is that you have some different tape speed options. For this one, you've got the choice of either seven and a half inches per second or 15 inches per session per second. Um, there's no option for 30 inches per second. And I guess that's reflecting the nature of the original machine. So with all of that said, let's just see how it sounds on this electric guitar. I'm going to start off with it switched off and then I'll switch it off and on and you can see what difference you can hear. So next up we have the Tape Machine 80. Now this is modelled on the Studer A80 Mark II tape machine from the 70s and 80s. And I must confess, I've never used the actual tape machine in real life, but I do have a number of plugins which emulate this machine. And I must say, I do tend to gravitate towards it. I do like the sound of this machine. It's got a lot of warmth in the low end and some nice crisp airiness in the top end I always find. So I was kind of set up with this one for this to be my favourite. I'll let you decide how good it is when you listen to it but I've decided to use it on my drums now um, there's a couple of differences between this and the last one so the tape speed um, there's only the choices of 15 and 30 on this one so that, that's actually the main difference the, the other difference I'd like to point out is the switches here notice they do have a lamp to indicate when they're off or on so with all of that said I'll let you decide how you think it's sounding on my drums I'll start off with it switched off and then I'll switch it on So 
So we're finishing off with the Tape Machine 99. Now this was modelled on a Revox PR99 Mark II from the 1980s again. And I've done something quite different with this one. But first of all, let's just have a look at the differences it has with some of the other tape machines. And not a lot to talk about here. The main difference being from some of the others, again, is the tape speed. So we can either have it on 7.5 inches per second or 15 inches per second there. Apart from that, all of the other controls are just the same. Now the difference with this one is that I've applied it to a master, so I'm using it on the whole song. Now if you find when you're using these plugins you've used a few of them and you get to the stage um, where you're putting this on the master bus in the mix, you really may find that your system starts to struggle because with all of these plugins, they do have quite a high CPU overhead and that's because they're using a very, very high quality oversampling in the algorithm. So you get good results from them, but there's a price to pay and that's in CPU usage. So I would recommend that once you've set up your basic sound with these plugins, um, then you actually print that or bounce it to a track and then eliminate the plugin. And you know, really, you're probably going to have these right at the beginning of your effects chain anyway. So um, I would either have them in the first position, or if you're using a preamp uh, emulator, for example, you might have them just after the preamp. But put them on in that um, initial position there and then bounce it down once you're happy with your sound and then apply your other effects in real time. After that, you should be fine. So keep that in mind when you're applying them. And all we're going to do is just have a quick listen to this. First of all, with it switched off, and then I'll switch on so you can hear the difference. So if you can hear the differences on your phone speaker, then you've got very good listening abilities indeed, because it's much better to go ahead and follow the link in the description down below, download the audio files, and have a listen on your studio monitors or on some headphones. That's a much better way to discern the differences with plugins like these. When you've done that, let me know what differences you can hear or not in the comments down below. This is what this video is all about, not about me telling you what I think about the differences difference, but what you can actually hear with your own ears. I'd love to hear from you guys on that. Now, if you did like this video, make sure you hit the like button. That lets YouTube know that other people should watch this video as well. If you didn't like this video for any reason whatsoever, hit the dislike button twice. And if you do like this kind of content, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you're notified about my future videos. And don't forget, if you're interested in any of the equipment that you can see in my videos, then follow the link for my my gear guide where you can find out about all of the gear that I've used in the past and I'm currently using. Now with all of that said, I will see you in the next video.